what we physically touched before the production run to like sign off like, yes, we're okay with making this product. And what came off the line were wildly different. When we opened that first pouch and pulled the stick out and it was just like, we thought it was trash at the time. This is, a, I'm using very harsh words here. I was heartbroken. Some people were recommending we not sell it at all and basically trash the production run and redo it. And that would have killed the company. This is Start at the Storefront. Today's guests are Jay Kim and John Sherwin of Hydrant, a company that makes a powdered electrolyte mix that helps you rehydrate your body quicker and more efficiently than just water without all the extra sugar that comes in traditional sports drinks. Look, it's not like electrolytes are new science. I can basically assume that we've all seen plenty of drinks advertising electrolytes in the grocery store. But John wasn't satisfied with what was on the market. So he put his biology degree from Oxford to work in creating a better blend in order to get H2O into your bloodstream faster. When he met Jay, the duo wasted no time at all in getting this idea off the ground and into stores. It was only three weeks after having met that they signed a co-founder agreement. So listen in as we cover everything from John admitting that he wasted too much time in perfecting the formula, why they initially thought flavor didn't really matter, and why there is some truth behind the recommendation to drink eight glasses of water a day. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have John and Jay from Hydrant. What was your first step in starting the company and what made you guys want to do it? Was it something like you were, you were having, maybe, maybe you guys were drinking Gatorade and thought this is, there's way too much sugar in this. What was kind of the genesis of the idea? So I think Jay and I, initially, the story is kind of interesting. We, we were on parallel paths separately. We were not working together uh, and we came to it from a similar place, you know, hard work life schedules that were leaving us drained of energy, over consuming caffeine, leaving to like a downward spiral of caffeine consumption, just more and more and more, uh, looking for ways to get out. In my case, uh, it was a blend of from my college days uh, and then working in Silicon Valley briefly, trying to like stay afloat. In Jay's case, from this like intense finance background where you're just constantly working. Mm. Um, he was introduced to it by a friend who uh, showed how to like reduce the uh, caffeine consumption on a daily basis with a, a hack to hack hydration, so to speak. And in my case, it was really looking at medical students and seeing how they were handling their hydration and, and the products they were using. They were disgusting, but really, really effective. And so then I looked at Gatorades of the world and other formats of hydration and, and found kind of, so one major problem was excessive sugar. Another problem was taste and it just generally being gross. And then the third one being using ingredients like artificial colors, flavors, and sweeteners. Nothing was really simple and effective and set up in a way that you could drink it on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day, and not get fatigued on the flavor or those ingredients. Was Pedialyte one of the ones that the uh, medical students were using? Yeah. <laughs> um, in the UK, there was a product called Diorolite that still is a product called Diorolite. Great um, name. Very similar branding to Pedialyte, different companies, I'm sure. And they have a powder format. Yeah. I never enjoyed the taste personally. Uh, and so, you know, we, we set out to build a version that people could use on a daily basis. Can you give us a science behind this? You know, we've all heard of electrolytes and, and especially like with Gatorade and whatnot, but like, why are electrolytes so much better for your body to absorb the, the water or the hydration? When you drink water, you absorb water as well. The process is passive. So water is moving across your the lining of your digestive system into your bloodstream passively via the process of osmosis. When you add the right blend of electrolytes and a little bit of sugar, um, there's actually a pump system or mechanism in the lining of your digestive system that allows you to actively move the electrolytes into your bloodstream, which draws more of the water across that membrane. So you're able to hydrate faster and absorb the water earlier in the digestive system rather than later. And what was your first step in moving forward? Did you guys have to, it sounds like you have a scientific background, but did you have to start finding your supplier, a wholesaler that would at least manufacture? What was the first step there? Yeah, that was a, a journey. So I, I don't have a food and beverage background, uh, neither does Jay. So it, it really was just learning as we went. Um, the first step was finding a formulator. So although I have the science background to figure out, you know, what are the uh, target levels of sodium, potassium, magnesium, and zinc that we want to hit, I didn't know 
how to make it taste good. And that's really where the food scientist or formulator comes in. So finding them is the first step. They often know a bunch of co-packers who are the next step, who actually take your formula and bring it to life. And they can make those introductions for you, uh, along with doing our own independent research there. How much testing do you have to do? Like how much back and forth were there in terms of taste testing just to get it right? And how, how long did that take? So we've shortened the time down. Back then, the first version was easily six months. It should not take wow. that long. There were a number of issues that led to that. And I think also something I repeat now is I wasted too much time perfecting the formula. Should have been launched after three. Just should have put it out there. got real feedback from customers. We waited too long to get it, quote unquote, perfect. But the reality was as soon as we started getting in the hands of customers, there was more feedback and we still made changes after the fact. So we should have just moved faster. I love that. I tell every entrepreneur, just launch it, be embarrassed of it, get the feedback, just begin the feedback because especially with flavors, right? It's <laughs> like the market could love strawberry and then you're over here working on like, let's say lime, lemon, lime, but in mm -hmm. reality, no one likes lemon, lime. And so, yeah, the feedback is super important. Did you, did you guys um, bootstrap at the beginning or did you raise maybe like a friends and family around in the first, the first few days? I can speak a little bit to the, the the journey. I had built the sort of shell of Hydrant's brand in the original product while Jay was parallel pathing on the West Coast and we didn't know each other yet. I was getting like a little bit of traction. Mutual friend saw that Jay was trying to solve the problem and he and I have very different skill sets. I'm more on the product side. Jay's more on the business side. And this mutual friend of ours was like, hey, you guys should meet and like probably just work together. So um, we met. Before that, there had been like a small investment of my own money, a little bit of friends and family. But really, when Jay and I joined forces, he dropped out of business school. He was at Wharton, I think the shortest time before dropout ever, right, Jay? Three Something weeks. Like Three <laughs> weeks. Yeah. I love Three that. Weeks. You had I just gotten it. your syllabus and you were already out the door. Not even syllabus. <laughs> I just finished my orientation. Yeah. That provided the startup capital, the tuition money. That's the, yeah. the key. So piece I got my there. money back from Penn and then put it in Hydrant and that was a start the startup capital. So wait, so Jay, so you guys meet, how mm -hmm. long before, you know, how long did you guys chat, talk, understand yeah. each other's ideas, strengths, weaknesses before you're like, I'm ready to quit <laughs> business school? Yeah, def definitely. I don't think we, we fully assess each other's strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> uh, it, it was definitely the, probably the riskiest move. It took us three weeks from the mo moment of introduction to signing co-founder paper. So definitely fast, but we were, we were incredibly lucky. Yeah, no, for sure. Do you think you'll ever go back to business school or are you completely done with it? What is your mind? I, you know? I, I'm definitely completely done with it. It's, I think I it's a it. great place for some people, but I think for the things that I wanted, it wasn't a great fit. But I only realized after I got there. Jack Ma has this great quote and he talks about how school, basically talks about MBAs and how it's kind of useless. Mm. I have an MBA, so I can, I can totally say it is useless. And um, he talks about how schools are about acquiring knowledge and mm. startup is about acquiring wisdom. And the only way you mm. acquire wisdom is through experience. But you can work mm. really hard acquiring uh, wisdom through experience while you're acquiring knowledge just through hard work, right? Just through mm. like Googling mm. accounting, just through totally. Googling product. And I think, you know, truer words have never been said. I, I think from my perspective, the MBA program was like a cop out, frankly. It was like, I have no mm. idea what I want to do. I think I'm really capable of a lot of things, but I, I need this time to figure it out. And right, for me, totally. it was like, if I have the MBA, it's a good backup plan, which is the worst thing. Or it's like, stop. And I knew it the whole time. I'm like going through business school, like this is <laughs> such shit. I can't believe I'm doing this. But so kudos to you. I'm very proud. That's amazing. I'm glad you guys met. That's crazy. Three weeks. And then you guys move forward. What was that like? Did one of you move? Do you guys like decide I, to get I an office space? From, you moved from Philly to New York, obviously. I think I was hopping around at Airbnb, friends places for like two months in New York City until I found a place. Um, but we had an office in WeWork uh, in a share, share space. And then what was your first step from that, that point out? So you have the formula down. You, it sounds like you had the product and the marketing set. Did you guys go online first? Did you go Amazon first? What was the, what was the first step from there? So we were website first. So we launched in September of 2018. And then we launched in Amazon on December of 2018. But on the first six weeks, we focused on raising capital. Yes, we had that startup capital from my tuition money. But we wanted to first have, 
have more capital so that we have more resource to test different concepts so that we get to learn about customers more in depth. So we raised about 1.7 million in the first six weeks after we launched. Great angels, some people in my network, uh, ultimately uh, this incubator in the under the Philadelphia 76ers in Philly called Sixers Innovation Lab. They led the seed round and uh, we raised the money around. We finished raising the money around November of 2018. Sixers Innovation Lab. Just give us a window when you were raising money. Did investors get it right away? Did they realize there was a void in the market for this kind of product? Or what was the one thing they kept coming back to? So I would say people didn't really get the void in, in the in the market, at least the, the investors that we spoke to in, mm-hmm. in, in the beginning. I think it's because we prioritize a lot of Silicon Valley investors. And to them, CPG wasn't really a a concept right. that they were really interested in. They were just kind of thinking, is this another Warby Parker? Oh, another <laughs> pen dropout trying to sure. pursue Warby, Casper, you know, all, all birds of the world. I think individuals, they just kind of made a bet on us. So it wasn't a problem. Interestingly, we recently raised Series A and I would probably say the Series A investors understood the space a lot more than the, the people that we spoke to from the, from the get-go. So there was really less like selling on the uh, market opportunity on the Series A. It was just more around proving our ability to execute and, and hit the metrics that, that we need to hit. Yeah, congratulations. I just saw that you guys raised 5.7. You closed the round and, and yep. it looks like, so while COVID's happening, you guys are closing Series A. Pretty unbelievable. <laughs> We're very grateful to have the resource in this hard time, yeah. Yeah, give us a sense of uh, your product in terms of in terms of how it sells. Where is it selling? Have you seen any spikes because of COVID? Has there been a downturn? What does that look like? So currently, we're selling on our website, drinkhydrant.com, Amazon, Whole Foods in the Northeast, so um, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. I would probably say the area where we had the biggest spike was Amazon. I think on our website, it's been pretty stable. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, it's, it's only been Amazon that had a big spike in the beginning during the peak of COVID and then it kind of neutralized. Now we're seeing everything as like business as usual. And now that you have the 5.7 million, what's your next step? Is it raising a bunch of people? Is it growing the retail chains? What do you, what's like, um, obviously you're focused on all of it, but what are sort of like the one and two things that you're going to be spending a lot more time in? I would probably say like one is to really double down on people, not only hiring people, but really investing in our culture. So we are really big in uh, data-driven DNA culture. So we'll probably investing in data analytics related softwares to make sure that we're uh, making choices based on data. And then the second piece is to support our go-to-market strategy. And this not only applies to supporting expansion of retail, but also our online and Amazon expansion as well. And in terms of new products, anything new coming out that you're working on, new flavors? And what's the what does that look like? Yeah, so... Um... Absolutely new flavors. We've, we've got some new functions coming down the road as well. Can't, can't share much about the functions specifically, but the kind of interesting insight we found was early on, probably because of my scientific background, function was very much like the, the highest order. It was always, you know, we launched with a single, a single flavor, thinking, why would people want more than one flavor? <laughs> it's the best functional product with the fewest possible ingredients. Surely flavor doesn't matter how wrong we were. People love flavor and they love hydrants flavor. And so giving them that variety is really important. So actually through this summer, we're going to be dropping some new flavors. Uh, and then later this year, there'll be some new products as well that we're really excited about, but keeping tightly under wraps until uh, until launch day. Okay. And then just just a question in terms of the data analytics that you're trying to work on. What What is the data that, you, that you're really looking to get? So obviously you're getting a lot of customer data, I imagine, but what else is uh, what are the key pieces of data that are really valuable to your business? I would probably emphasize two different components. One is to get more detailed with our cohort data to really understand our customer purchase behavior in various angles, because that's going to help us figure out how can we really stretch our marketing investment opportunities to get the biggest bang for the buck. So that's like one piece. Second piece is more around the framework when we're evaluating opportunities. Although we are operators, we really view ourselves as an investors. And what I mean by that is we have to always think about risk and reward when it comes to investment opportunities, whether it's marketing, whether it's hiring, whether it's hiring a vendor, 
we have an internal processes that really go deep in the due diligence around the return investment that we're making. So the analytics would be really focused around that framework. This is why I love the podcast because we can talk about things like yield, right? It's like you're focusing yeah. <laughs> on yield and, and you're so right. Cause like I'm, I'm here analyzing your product. I'm ingesting everything you're saying. And I'm like, oh, my brain's like, oh, if I were them, maybe I would be at Equinox or like with the gyms. But I know I have no data to support that argument, right? And so then it's like, well, how does that look in terms of yield to them? Um, can you give us a window into what feels directionally correct for you guys as you think about maybe digital advertising, maybe partnering with influencers, maybe whatever it is that you're trying to sort of grow as you as you scale with the new Series A? So I think first is to double down and optimize on the core channels that we're seeing strong strong traction. So like a lot of other uh, brands, we are definitely seeing strong results in Facebook and Instagram marketing. So it's really doing more of that, but in a better way and at scale. So that's one component. Second is we're exploring other new channels that we can potentially scale, whether that's podcast, TV, newsletter. Um, those are something that we're also exploring. Influencer is something interesting channel that we are exploring, but we haven't really pushed aggressively on. I think right now, because of COVID, there's been a lot of like, I think delays with things that can like help us uh, running influencer or marketing. So that's something we're really looking into, but we haven't really pushed hard on. We've had people on the podcast that have gone on to sell their company. Like uh, we had one guy who sold his company to GoDaddy. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was the first time that his early investors heard the full story um, wow. from the podcast. Like not like they didn't know any, they, you know, <laughs> they knew, they knew that they made the investment and then they knew a couple of things along the way, like through the investor updates but they had no idea the intricacies and the fact that Brian, who was on the podcast, he was the CEO, was mm -hmm. like a day away from missing payroll. And he talked about that on the podcast, you know? Any key moments for you guys, any like dark moments where you guys, maybe even just in raising this round during COVID, right? I'm sure you started to raise the round probably at the beginning of this year. Anything you can just give us a sense of like, man, it was not pretty, but we, we found a way. I mean, from my perspective, I don't think we've seen anything like, too detrimental. And I think partially that's because whatever we do, we try to think months, months, months in advance because we have that risk versus reward mentality. So because of that framework, we've thankfully never had to run into a situation where, hey, we're one month away of like running out of cash or two months you know, away from running out of cash. We haven't had that kind of Jesus moment, but I'm sure we've had like a couple of other big mistakes where they gave us a lot of pressure. I think the one that comes to mind for me is um, a production run gone mm. awry. Uh, so in the CPG world, uh, unlike the software world, you kind of are beholden to co-packers. Co-packers are factories that produce products for a number of companies, and you effectively rent time on their machines through agreements. And no one, I guess the lesson that I will describe here is that no one cares about your product as much as you do. Mm. Uh, and so... We went through all of these processes of tech. We were launching a new brand, like a new branding, visual refresh. Uh, we were changing our material supplier for our packaging. I'm sure there was a COGS improvement, but I think there was also like a material improvement, barrier improvement. Like it was, it was supposed to be like the coolest launch ever. We were also switching factory. In hindsight, way too many variables at once, mm. but we didn't know that at the time. And what we, you know, physically touched before the production run to like sign off like yes we're okay with making this product and what came off the line were wildly different and when we opened that first pouch and pulled the stick out and i was just like oh my this is i mean we thought it was trash at the time this is a, i'm using very harsh words here that was the first reaction we are our own harshest critics the reality was like product was totally fine inside it was very safe the ceiling was good it just like the it was like a candy wrapper the materials feel okay we all, i was heartbroken devastated it was it was <laughs> it just really sucks and i know this may not sound like a, a dark time but for us with the moment in time that we were at with some of our investors like seeing this it was like ah oh, really this this is bad guys like this is there was some some people were recommending we not sell it at all and basically trash the production run and redo it and that would have killed the company yeah, yeah. if we have done that we we wouldn't be here. Yeah. So luckily we pushed through yeah. and again, like the product was totally safe to consume. It just didn't hit the bar for aesthetics that we wanted. 
Not that people are necessarily thinking about aesthetics when they buy hydration, which is what we subsequently found. We included an insert with every order just saying, look, you know, this was our relaunch. Kind of sucks that it's not perfect. Uh, because it's not perfect, here's a discount on your next order. And like, we hope you come back to try the, the real deal when it comes off the line. And it ended up being totally fine. But the first few moments from like, well, I say moments, it was a couple of weeks from seeing the thing. And she's like, ah, oh, this is just, it sucks. So those Definitely were some dark more than times. Definitely more than a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. a couple months <laughs> to get through that. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like when you when you saw that come back to you and you thought it was trash, and then the decision, if you had decided to scrap it, would have financially ruined you guys. Hearing that, it's almost like it was never an option because you see this as like, well, this is either the end of the road or we push forward. I mean, the, the decision then seems pretty cut and dry. You push forward. But good on, on you guys to have the presence of mind to manipulate it. So, you know, you send out a note to everyone like saying, hey, we know this is not up to our standards and expectations. So here's a discount on your next order. I'm curious what you saw from repeat orders as a result of that. Was it, was it pretty um, consistently high or, or was there a dip because of the packaging and, and how it looked? Definitely not a dip. But there are a number of different variables at the same time. So we had this discount code going out, which was like 25%, which is fairly meaningful in our business. So that definitely drove some repeat. But also we had launched a new formulation. So um, we'd listened to feedback on V1 of our product. And this was not only the refresh of the branding, it was also the refresh of the product. It dissolved better and it tasted slightly better. And you could really see in the numbers the retention improvements based on well, I guess we think the flavor, the, the taste and the dissolving piece. Again, just listening to customer feedback and wrapping that into future product development. This reminds me of a time we, uh, I had a bow tie company a long time ago and our first order of ties, it, we had like, they were huge, like massive <laughs> clown bow ties. And I just thought this is the end. And uh, we none of us were from the fashion world, right? And so we didn't know anything, but it turns out there's a, there's a, a, a bow tie called the butterfly bow tie and it's a style and it's a huge bow tie. So we, we, just, we all of a sudden became a company that only sold butterfly style bow ties. <laughs> and it turns out there's a niche within the bow tie community of buyers. Huh. And um, we just repositioned some marketing, but similar story. It was so devastating because I would put it on yeah. myself and I, was, I just looked like, I thought I looked stupid. So it was like, if I think I look stupid, there's a whole host of other people who are likely to think the same thing. Right. Right. Uh, right. Turned out, turned out there's a, there's a style. One thing I want to get into, and maybe John, you're, you're the best person to answer this is like, what are some of the myths? What are some of the things that people get totally wrong about either electrolytes or hydration or this space in general? Yeah. So firstly, like that's a huge question because nutrition as a, as a field is so hard to get a clear result from anything that you change. There are so many variables in your body at any given moment. And no one, I think, is able to run a perfect experiment on themselves or on a large group of people. So granted, all of the academic research data we base our product on is uh, what I would call systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So we will look at multiple different academic studies and pull out the individual results from them. How good was their statistical analysis? You know, how, how big was the sample size? And from that, draw our own conclusions. And that's part of our product development process. But in terms of hydration specifically, I, I think the, the myths are um, <laughs> that they are, they're out there in a big way. There's the eight cups of water, of course, which is the one that everyone thinks about. I don't really view that as a myth. I think it's pretty good guidance in that when you hear a lot from customers as we do, you hear about the extremes. And there are, peop there are these people on the very extremes who perhaps are not accustomed to kind of listening to the signals their bodies are sending them that say like, hey, you're thirsty, you need to drink. Or they just aren't kind of tune attuned to them in a way that they interpret them correctly. So my example would be, you know, often when you feel hungry, it's actually thirst. And thirst is hitting before hunger. If you eat, you're still going to feel hungry because you've interpreted the thirst incorrectly. And so that that's like a, a good example of a really simple signal your body sends you that Many of us, you know, I'm sure even now running a hydration company, I'm still guilty of it on a fairly regular basis. 
of reading that signal wrong and eating something when I should just be drinking something. So I think really rather than pointing, like rather than looking so much at the myths of the space, the way I look at it is it's getting people in a state of mindfulness about the signals their body is sending them. And that kind of ties into this area of routine that we really focus on as a business, which is how can we build, how can we help people to build better wellness routines on a day-to-day basis? Part of that is getting them attuned to those signals. And part of that is giving them a suite of products that allow them to make themselves healthier over time. And that's really like our approach to, I guess, the, the wellness space as a whole and counteracting any myths that are out there. Do you guys feel like you have to educate the market a tremendous amount? Oh yeah, 100%. So, I, I mean, I think what we found is there are a lot of people just want something that tastes good. Um, and I don't want to alienate that consumer with an overly sciencey message. What I really care about is making sure that in every circle of friends, there's usually like one person who has some some sort of scientific or health and wellness authority. Maybe it's the triathlete, maybe it's the medical student. I don't, you know, maybe it's the mom. Of, of a family. I want that person to be able to go deep on the science and find what they're looking for on Hydrant's website, because they're the person who's going to convert the most people to becoming Hydrant customers. And so as long as we have the science backing, mm. I feel comfortable pushing other messaging. And what we found is, you know, probably the majority of people are drinking Hydrant to drink more water. It gets them in the state of mindfulness that they should be drinking more water. You start your day with a hydrant, it tastes good, you feel great, you wanna keep that going throughout the day and you'll feel the benefits of drinking more water as well as adding those electrolytes to it. And that's what we hear back constantly in the reviews. It's so rewarding as a company. You know, we have a channel in our Slack, Voice of the Customer, um, where we like highlight some of the cool reviews and, and highlight things people are saying, good and bad. Um, but the, when the good ones come in, that that is really like where... I think a lot of our team satisfaction comes from hearing about how we've really changed people's lives with, you know, it's a pretty simple product, right? It's a hydration powder, but the way we've been able to impact people and their health through routines and through helping them find these different, educating them on the different use cases for our product is so rewarding for the team. How big is your team and how, how quickly did you have to grow it as you scaled? I think we have about 14 people full-time and two interns. We were a pretty small team for a while. I think we were three people until last spring and probably seven by end of the year last year. And we just like quickly really like hire fast this year. Yeah, we're, we're scaling pretty fast. I mean, I think by next year we could be 2025. I mean, we'll see. We'll see how this COVID plays out. But yeah, we're in a path to hiring a lot of people. So for people listening, if you're looking for a job, it sounds like you guys are hiring uh, remotely. Or are you guys uh, focusing on a certain area? Because you talked about that culture you want to build. So are you focusing on building out that office in New York? Yeah, I mean, now we have our office in New York, in Tribeca. We would love to get together in our office. But right now, given the situation, everyone's remote. We even have a an employee who is based in New York City, but he's from Korea. So for a couple months, he's working out in Korea, working out of Eastern time zone, which is kind of crazy, but yeah. I wanted to I just go back to something, John, you said. So it sounds like people are starting their day with your product, which is amazing. And so when you think about the competitors, and maybe this has changed, you know, since you guys first launched, but who, who were your direct competitors when you first started and who are they now? So I think the way we would look at it always would be Given the, the similarities between traditional sports drinks and our products, traditional sports drinks really kind of own or have owned up until now this idea of the electrolyte. No one really was talking about electrolytes in other products. Mm. And so, you know, there are some absolute behemoths in that industry who have, you know, 70% plus market share and others with pretty much like 28, 29 and, and the rest of them are fighting over the one or 2% left. I think there's a huge opportunity there around educating consumers better on these other use cases that are perhaps more proactive than reactive. So I don't think our, our competitors set has necessarily changed as we've, as we've grown the company, excuse me. I think now that we've, we've learned a lot from listening to customers, from building out this morning routine and how 
building those habits has such an impact on their lives. I think the future product roadmap will probably diverge a little bit from those um, traditional sports drinks that I mentioned. But largely, you know, we're not getting away from hydration. Water as a delivery vehicle for all of these other benefits is a large part of the benefit as a whole, if that makes sense. I would probably just say water is our friend and an enemy. Because like, yes, they're a friend because we need water to make our product work. But sometimes people will just think like, oh, I don't need electrolytes. I can just drink water. So mm-hmm. sort of a friend of me. That's why we, we, we really need to communicate the, uh, the, the science piece in order for them to really get the value prop. In terms of your product, to, just to go to like some data, are there some pockets of either the United States or even globally that the growth rate in terms of maybe electrolyte awareness is at a point where you're like, oh, wow, we're, we're killing it. Let's just say in Los Angeles, people seem to be aware, certain pockets of the country or even outside of the United States that this is really something that has caught on in a much faster way. I don't really have a industry specific report that talks about electrolyte market growth internationally per se but i am able to indicate that not only domestically we are seeing internationally there are some companies that are emerging that are talking about electrolytes and how a lot of consumers are adopting it whether it's in a powder format or it's in tablet format to kind of crave something more than just water alone whether it's for hangover whether it's for fatigue for something so I think we're definitely seeing a strong trend on the adoption rate of some kind of added electrolyte products in order for people to feel better globally. I have something to say about your name. I actually think it's perfect. It's it's informative and evocative of what your yeah. company does. But I'm curious how you guys settled on it and were there other options thrown around there in the decision-making process? There was one early on and I'm so glad we didn't go that route. I don't think the trademark was available. Um, this is way early. I looked at the the name solution. So the idea being like, this is a solution for all your problems, but also powder and water exactly. makes a solution. A chemical solution, um, yeah. Yeah, so it, it seemed really clever. I think it was a little bit, um, it, it didn't have enough intrigue there. It was it was too clever for its own good. Hydrant has same same first five letters as hydrate, hydration. It sounds good. You know, hydrants are life-saving kind of things in real life. And uh, this idea of a water delivery mechanism that is there when you need it kind of spoke to us. So, you know, we're really happy with with how it's turned out. And I think as we build other sort of functions into our product lines, having that word as our brand name really helps to like focus back to water as the, the main delivery source. When you weigh the two, solution and hydrant, uh, hydrant definitely comes out on top. I just see this like amazing Super Bowl ad. I can like picture this ad. There's so much working, right? There's like a hydrant. It's something that people walk by every day, but they underappreciate. So there needs to be knowledge given to it, but it's also so vital. You just tap into the hydrant. We'll give you guys a call when we're running our first Super Bowl ad. (laughs) When you guys think about the future of your company or even you guys as entrepreneurs, I mean, you're both young you know, what does it look like for you? Or is it something that you, you know, you hope to exit and maybe the next, let's say by 2025, and there's other areas that you guys are thinking about or excited about what's kind of like the future of your own personal growth? I think for now, what we're just really focused on is hitting the goals that we have for ourselves, really focusing on the process that we think results will follow. We don't want to be distracted by thinking about what could happen to us in the next three years, five years, 10 years. So for now, we're just kind of heads down, executing, focusing on all the processes that we've laid out for ourselves and for our employees. Yeah. And and to build on that, I think something that's important is making sure that the business mission aligns personally to an extent and finding ways that you can really feel fulfilled personally through your work. Uh, And so for Myself and a number of members on the team, our environmental or planetary impact is really important as well. And already, you know, we're doing a lot of work by diverting people from a ready to drink plastic bottle, which has somewhere in the region of uh, 90, well, hang on, let me make sure I get my percentages right. I think a stick of hydrant drunk from a reusable water bottle is 94% less plastic by weight than a ready to drink 
20 ounce, you know, traditional sports drink bottle. So we're on our way to having an impact there. And I think there's a lot more to be done in that space that we're already exploring. Um, and I want to make sure that that's an area we're going to keep, keep working in throughout the lifetime of the business. Yeah. I, I imagine Lee, I mean, just before, just doing some research before talking to you guys, I was just thinking of blue land. It's this right there. There's no plastic at all. We had them on the podcast. Yeah. It's like one of these things where plastic was meant to last forever, but it's only used once and that's part of their marketing yeah. and um, super interesting. I mean, thanks for coming on the podcast. Tell everyone where they can find you guys mention, you know, whole foods online, tell everyone where they can find you. So drink hydrant.com on our social media handle is drink hydrant. Or you can type hydrant electrolyte on Amazon, go to Whole Foods near New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. We'll be there. Make sure that you're uh, staying hydrated. I love it. Look out for hydrant. If you guys are looking for a job, they're hiring in New York. They just raised the big <laughs> series A. So it's, it's good to hear of a success story during COVID. Thank you guys for coming on. I appreciate it.